Japan. Who else? Out of state? France. France. They did pretty well this year, didn't they? Yeah. Where else? Come on. So Ohio. <laughs> We're in Ohio. Columbus. I'm from Cincinnati. Good stuff. No, I saw another hand or two. Come on. Michigan. Michigan. Don't talk to the guy from Ohio, right? <laughs> Sorry? Saudi Arabia. Fantastic. Where else? Anybody else? Okay. Good. Do you want to All do right. Yeah, let's uh, get started. Thank you for coming. This is a part, as you know, of the Cohen Speaker Series, a uh, speaker series that is funded by Ron and Sandy Cohen, uh, alumni at Marshall University College of Business. We have today a distinguished speaker, Jim Dating. Jim is on our advisory board for the College of Business. Um, has been you know, involved in a number of things with us strategically for the college, has been a big supporter of our Beta Gamma Sigma initiatives that many of you, you know, are involved in as well. Uh, Jim has also, is also an alumnus of the College of Business here. He, he went on to do his MBA from the University of New Haven and has got executive education from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Jim has a distinguished career in life sciences, biotech industry, pharmaceuticals. So he's going to bring an aspect of his experience that I think is very critical to the college of business because many of you not only have something to do with healthcare, healthcare is one of the largest sectors in the state and in this area, but also there are plenty of jobs around in the whole emerging market field where business students have a real possibility of building a career. So, so I think this fits in perfectly with not only his experience, but also I'm sure many of your interests in terms of how we explore a new industry where, where you know, a lot of the business graduates have, uh, can potentially build a career. So welcome and, and let's look forward to this speech. Thank Thanks, Avi. He used the word that uh, thank you. You'll have to decide if the word distinguished really fits afterwards. I heard it three times there, Avi. So, um, hey, Avi, it's, thank you for having me here. I graduated from Marshall in 1985. It pains me to say that 33 years ago and one day it'll and you, but I'm very proud having spent my time at Marshall. When I left Marshall in 1985, I entered the healthcare industry, and I've been in the healthcare industry ever since, 33 years. A number of different roles. I've worked in pharmaceutical, uh, biotechnology companies, medical device, diagnostics, healthcare IT, and venture capital, all focused on healthcare. Now, we have an issue with healthcare, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, when I left and when I joined the healthcare industry in 1995, Anybody have any guess what percentage of healthcare was, was, what percentage of that was part of our GDP, our gross domestic product, 1985? Any guesses? It was 8%, 8% of GDP. Next year, it will be 20% of our gross domestic product. That means that one out of every $5 of our gross domestic product in the United States is going to be spent on healthcare. You can look at that a couple of different ways, right? If you're looking for a job in healthcare, it's booming. There's a lot of great opportunities, and I'm going to share with you some insights, what you can do if you want to make a profession in healthcare. And that doesn't mean you have to be a scientist. I was speaking to our science students this morning uh, about careers in science, but there's a lot of opportunities we're going to talk about if you want to get into healthcare that can be business-oriented as well. The downside, one out of every $5 spent goes to healthcare. It's not sustainable. You're from France. Any idea what France's percentage of GDP goes towards healthcare? 10%, 10 points. So we're twice as much as France. Um, and, and we'll talk about some pluses and minuses of that. Let me let me jump right in here and just give you a little bit of overview. So uh, I mentioned I've spent 33 years in this marketplace. I've, uh, I've held a number of different roles. I've been fortunate to be an expat. That means an expatriate. I've lived overseas for five years, almost six years, between um, Germany, Singapore, Malaysia, and Canada. Great experience. Does anybody ever want to live overseas and be an expat and work? One. Where do you want to go one day? Germany. Germany. Great. You speak the language? Fantastic. We'll have to catch up later there. <laughs> and, uh, compare notes. Uh, I bought a business in Germany two years ago, and I'm there every six weeks or so uh, to help integrate it. It's, it's growing nicely. What a great experience for your career. If you ever want to do it, you'll 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 learn a couple of things. One, it helped me put me on a fast track for future career opportunities, like having lived outside the US. Two, you'll think very differently about our country when you leave and go live outside of the country and you get a different perspective. Every time I go to Germany, I get in a cab and they say, tell me about President Trump. 
And there's always lots of stories that you can imagine one way or another uh, about that. But you know, I hope you get an opportunity to do that at some point. All right, so let's um, let's talk about my experience here at Marshall. So as I mentioned, I was here 1981 through 1985. Uh, I was resident advisor for three years, joined a fraternity, played soccer. Um, every speaker that came on campus, I tried to get to as many as I could. I was a junkie for when we had guest lectures come in, uh, enjoyed performing arts. It was a great experience. Uh, I heard Columbus, I mentioned I'm from Cincinnati. I had looked at about a dozen schools in the area. I wanted to be within a day's drive of home. Ended up uh, here. Uh, and, and the thing that I put at the bottom that really distinguished it, I know we have several professors here, and I don't have any reason to suck up to them anymore at this point, so I can say whatever I want. I think the professors here, I had never seen anything like that in the other schools. And I sat in classes here and other places as part of my search, and I thought they were <coughs> really went the extra mile to try to uh, get the best out of you, find out what you wanted to do. We're all a little rough. We've got some edges here and there. And, and they really, I thought, were more personable than other places. I remember I went to Ohio State and uh, sat in a lecture hall, and there were 400 kids in this lecture hall. And the professor was calling out students, and he was calling out numbers, not names, numbers, to answer questions or to address things very impersonal. I didn't see any of that there and, and uh, here, and I certainly hope that it's not the case. I doubt that's the case with the leadership of Bobby and Dr. Gilbert. So, when, when I look forward to a career in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry, I see an evolving landscape. I see a growth area. I mentioned that. Think about this. Uh, biologics. A biologic is a, is a drug that can actually cure a disease. So if you get a cold, you go to the drugstore, you pick up a... Uh, Aspirin, you pick up something for your cold uh, to have no stop running, or if you've got allergies, those are small molecules. Those are simple drugs. They treat symptoms. I'm in the business today in trying to cure disease. The FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, has approved nine drugs this year. Five of those drugs came out of our shop. We helped put those drugs on the marketplace that will cure disease. Two of those were cures for cancer that prolong life or can save your life one for hepatitis C, one for multiple sclerosis. So I'm gonna share with you some examples of where we're really making a difference. And if you're in passion to go in that field, I've got some ideas for you. Two, when you enter a marketplace, you wanna think about future dynamics. Um, coal industry, the current administration now, but it may not have a near and dear to home. The marketplace I'm in is expected to more than double uh, excuse me, it was almost double, pardon me, over the next five years. A lot of growth in this area. Furthermore, the drugs that we're working on um, really make a difference in the world. And to me, that was important. I remember when I graduated from school, I had a couple of different opportunities. I could go work at Kroger. I had an offer to go work at Xerox. I chose pharmaceuticals at the time because I thought I could make a bigger impact that was more fulfilling to me. Everybody's wired differently, but that's what worked for me. And I'm going to share some examples with you today. So pharma and biotech, there's a lot of different areas that, that you could go into outside of science that we talked a little bit about. Um, when you think of some of these roles up here, business development, sales, operations, making things sure that things run, project management, communications. I've just hired a communication, marketing communication person to help us with all of our information. Uh, marketing and market research. My background here was marketing, marketing and management. Um, we just hired a, a senior marketing person. We're looking to hire a junior person right now. Analytics, finance, uh, QA, Q QC, uh, human resources. Uh, I have 10 direct reports. My 10 direct reports all following this area. So if you've got an interest in those careers, I'm more than happy to talk with you afterwards or answer some questions about jobs. We've hired over 100 people this year to date. Expansion, new roles. Next year, we're, you know, that number will be closer to 150. So great growth in our industry um, outside of just the science field. And I'll give you a couple more examples. So here's some companies that you may have heard of. Does anybody know who the largest pharmaceutical company is in West Virginia? They're not up here. Milan. Milan, correct. 
That's right. Milan was on 60 Minutes not too long ago, not for, for not a very positive impact. They were raising prices tremendously. They were taking advantage of a marketplace and they got some negative publicity. Uh, it's not a core market here. When you think of pharmaceutical and biotechnology, there's a couple hotbeds. Cambridge, Massachusetts has over 600 biotechnology companies there. And just at the Boston Cambridge area. San Francisco has over 500. San Diego has over 300. Where I am in North Carolina, we have over 200. So there tend to be pockets or clusters of, of companies. Why do you think there's clusters like that? Any, any thoughts? Orders? Come on. Remember, you, you've got companies, you, you've got demand, as Alan Smith, where you, you create uh, companies, you get certain expertise, and it starts building, like GSK, a pharmaceutical company, they spin out, people start entrepreneur companies, and an ecosystem builds up around it, and it keeps growing and growing and growing. So you'll see a lot of those areas right now in Boston, San Francisco, San Diego, and RTP. Where I am in RTP, there's 12 companies like mine. It just grows. It's, it's a hotbed for contract research jobs. So when you think of some other thoughts about the industry, uh, my company in particular, we're what's called a contract research lab. We help pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies get their product to the marketplace quicker and safer. We don't do testing on animals, but we test the product and we help optimize it to make sure it's safe. And we work with them to make sure they can get through for the regulatory agencies, people like the FDA, or Food and Drug Administration, to get them to the marketplace. Right now, our company is working on 700 different drugs, 700 different molecules, I should say, that we're working on. Um, we've got almost 200 scientists, uh, from PhDs to uh, analysts to scientists to QA. And as I mentioned earlier, I've got another 50 people in non-science related fashions, and that's growing quickly in the business world, and I'll talk with you about that today. So, how can you use your business degree at a scientific company? There's a lot of different roles that you could look at, and specifically potential business areas. Does anybody see one missing up here? I, I realized it's bad QC on my part. I missed a big one. Some of you are probably studying it. Finance, very good. That's the one missing. You were going to have something else that I missed? I was saying finance. Okay, good. Yep, finance. I don't know how I do it. Bad QC on the plane, I guess. Um, but finance, clearly, uh, we've got a CFO, we've got accounts payable, we've got accounts receivable, we've got analytics, we've got people doing sales metrics. But a lot of different careers right now that we're looking to hire people right now. Now, you got to be mobile. You can either, if you're going to work for us, you're going to be in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, which is between Chapel Hill and Raleigh, or you're going to be in, in Germany. Um, we're looking to do something in Asia by the end of the year. <laughs> so, uh, if you're mobile and you're willing to move, there's a lot of growth in this area today, and, and uh, I hope you'll consider it because it's a it's a rewarding area that um, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunities to move up and in vertical to move within company and company as well. So, ways to prepare for your career. Um, I mentioned we've hired over 100 people year to date. Um, one of my colleagues, someone, uh, our co-founder, screens, he tells me about 200 resumes a week. He's speaking over at the Science Center right now, Ashton Safavi. <coughs> I asked Ashton how long he spends on a resume. He said, the bad ones I kill within about 20 seconds, the good ones I'll take two minutes on and really go through. And if it's somebody I like, we'll, we'll get them up on the phone. For every 100 resumes he gets, he usually gets on the phone with about 8 to 10. 8 to 10, he said, I'll, I'll send him a note back, I'll do a quick screen phone call. For every one of those eight to ten, he brings one or two in-house, flies them in for an interview. For every one of those one to two, one of them usually gets hired. About half of them get hired that come in-house like that. What do you think you have to do to stand out? What do you think, what, what, what would make you unique? First of all, what percentage of you are seniors? Raise your hand. Over half. Juniors? Sophomores or below? Nobody. Okay. So, you're all starting to think about jobs, and that's a good timing. Hopefully, if you're a senior, you, you've done internships, which is very important in our eyes. Uh, we hire five interns every summer, and they're usually <laughs> people in between their junior and senior year who say, hey, I, I might want to go work at this company. Let me go work there. You know, pay you a lot, 15 to $20 an hour. 
but it's an incredible experience because we typically move those people around over a summer. They'll spend time in HR, finance, marketing, operations, QA, and an eight-week period of time, four to eight weeks, depending on who they are, they're going to see everything we do, and we're going to see if it's a good fit. Usually about half those people come on board with us in future years. We hire them after they graduate. We, uh, if we like them a lot, we make them an offer, and they've got their senior year is a little bit more of a breeze. They can enjoy things because they know they've got a job with us come spring, which is a nice feeling. Um, internships can be a little tough. There's opportunities to volunteer, to network, to get involved. How many of you have a uh, LinkedIn account? Raise your hand. Good. Every one of you in this room should have a LinkedIn account. It's one of the most valuable tools you can have. I don't know how many contacts I have. I lost track. I think it was eight or 9,000 contacts on LinkedIn. I know somebody, I, I don't accept that contact. Unless I see they went to Marshall. If I see they went to Marshall, I click on it. Somebody recently went to Marshall, uh, said, clicked on a LinkedIn, sent me a note and said, hey, I'm a chemistry major, I'm graduating, um, uh, can you help me? Is there something about biologics? Here's what I want to do. We hired that person. It just shows that the effect of social media and networking, the value of that. Now, here's a downside of social media. Uh, for everybody we hire, we do two things. One, they get a drug test. We've had two people fail this year, and we didn't hire them, believe it or not. It seems pretty Obvious, you're going to come work for us, you're going to have a drug test, and uh, you can't blame it on the bagel you had, which we let somebody be retested that didn't work the second time because they claimed the bought you said the bagel must have done something. Um, and secondly, we now have a background check on that person. What do you think comes up in background checks? Any thoughts? Social media. Social media, correct. The background company that we use now will go back and look at every social media post you've ever posted that they can find out there. If we find something that we say, hey, this, this is gonna be objectionable, or this person's got some concerns, pictures, postings, things that they've said that they've made, we don't hire We had our first person following that camp very recently. This was over $100,000 a year career role, uh, someone that we had made an offer to, and they failed the background check because of social media. You've heard it before, whatever you say or do, on social media, it lasts a lifetime. So my advice is be very careful with that. I know I'm stating the obvious, and I'm sure we don't have to worry about that here. Uh, other areas, uh, network. It, it sounds so obvious, but um, you meet somebody, get a business card, send them a note, uh, let them know what your interest is, do some research on companies that you want to go work at. When I was uh, uh, approaching my senior year, back in the day, you may not have heard of this, but we had to create a paper resume, we'd have to put it in a, an envelope, and we'd have to mail it somewhere. And I made a mistake. I sent out hundreds of those things. And of the hundreds, maybe I got three or four back. Looking back, had I done some research on those companies, customized it, tried to find out some people that I may have known, it would have gone a long way. Of those several hundred resumes that we get in every week, the ones that can find a connection with us, if they've customized it, if they are referenced a person that they've worked with, a drug, uh, a knowledge, why they want to come work with us. If, if, if it's customized, they get a second look. If it's generic, unless they're a superstar, we don't buy it. it we, they don't get processed. So I would encourage you to do whatever research you can to make it really worthwhile to, to really get past the front gate there. <clears throat> So, Marshall, I, I mentioned the professors. I mentioned just what a, a great program it is here. Um, here's just a couple of thoughts for you when you're preparing your resumes and your, your uh, applications to get ready to go work for somebody. Um, I mentioned I joined a fraternity my senior year at the time. I said, hey, that'll be good. I can try this vice president of the fraternity or rush chairman. It doesn't matter. Um, what matters, is, and it doesn't matter that you join a lot of clubs. What matters is what you do in those clubs. You're going to join something i want to see you taking a leadership role or i want to see an effect that you had from it if you're going to volunteer i want to see entrepreneurship or what you did that made a real difference the resume fillers we don't bother with <coughs> if you're adding the clubs that you did it doesn't matter but if you did something unique to stand out you were really good you took a leadership role student government uh, performing arts athletics something that says hey i didn't just participate i led Here's what I got out of it. Or I created a volunteer organization 
here's the impact that I made. That gets a second look. Something to think about. It goes a long way with us. We talked about networking yourself, differentiating. Um, I spent this morning with the folks in the college placement office here, and I was really impressed with them. You know, really impressed with what they they do. Um, the first couple interviews you do, I'll promise you, you're going to be bad. You will be. Don't let that first interview you do be with your first choice career. They do mock interviews here. They will help you set up. They will film you. They will help you set up uh, your LinkedIn accounts. They will help you with your resume. It's a free resource. I would take advantage of it. You said, hey, I want to go in the biotechnology world. They've got a network where they can say, hey, here's Marshall grads um, in biotechnology that you might want to think about. I've gotten a couple emails if we're willing to take uh, uh, calls. I, I got a resume uh, earlier today from someone associated with the school that, that is finishing up law school. We're going to be looking to hire a lawyer in about a year. Um, he is outside counsel right now. I would encourage you to leverage that career center. They ought to be your best friend to go through the mock interviews, the resume, the social media, the networking, the, the strategies to help you decide what you want to do. I'm conscious of time, so I'm moving forward pretty quickly here. But I did write down a couple odds and ends, and I'm sorry they're cliches and I'll apologize in advance, but I thought I'd give you a couple examples. Um, Avi had mentioned the advanced management degree that I got from Morton U Penn. Um, I was on their advisory board briefly, and what I thought was interesting is that I was speaking to the dean at U Penn, you know, an institution almost as famous as Marshall. It's not quite as it, with my heartstrings as much, but um, I asked the dean there uh, about the academic process and how they screen people. And he said, you know, our acceptance rate there is less than ten percent. Last year, for Morton, the MBA program. They received 250 applications where people had a perfect SAT score. Perfect, 250. You would assume every one of those 250 got in. And he said, no, we intentionally only let 50 of them in because we want diversity, which I thought was interesting. So he said, we want to see how they stand out and we want to see what inroads and how badly they want to be part of this. So I would encourage you that um, it's not just smart. Sure, it helps if you're do, having good grades, but they want I want to see, and they want to see hustle and hard work and that you're going to be committed to something. As part of our interviewing process, we ask a lot of questions, but the number one thing that we want to find out, are you a team player? Will you collaborate with people? In my company, when we're working on a drug or a molecule or a project with scientists, we form with groups, and these are typically four to six people that will work on a project with the best and brightest minds but depending on what we need, depending on what's going on, we interchange those groups a lot. When you have 600 different drugs that you're working on or different molecules, you're going to be moved around from group to group. And we want to make sure that we don't get a bad apple. I'm proud at Bioxalytics that our retention rate is over 90%, the highest in the industry. We've been uh, we've won last five out of six years, Inc. 5,000 less fastest growing companies. We've just won it again. Best places to work. We've been nominated seven times. We've won it three times. But we're not perfect. We let about 11% of our people go every year. We let them go because the number one reason, either they can't do the job or they're not a team player. They can't do it, meaning they're not willing to hustle, they're not, they, they don't have the aptitude. Or secondly, they may be brilliant in, in and of themselves, but if you can't work well with other people, if you can't communicate well, you're going to have a tough time fitting in. Second one, and this is easy for me, very easy. Surround yourself with people smarter than you. And uh, that's not been hard in my case. And what I've tried to do is find people different than me. At Biogelytics, 57% of our employees are women. Almost 30% are what we call diverse candidates. And diverse just doesn't mean people of color. We have people from 31 different countries working at Biogelytics. We try to find the best and brightest from all around the world and bring them to our shop, either in Europe or in the U.S. International Day is pretty fun when we do that. We did that last month, and people brought in dishes from their country. Their, uh, uh, country. You, you find out uh, who they are, what works, what's different, and you learn from them. So I would encourage you to hire people different than you, different skill sets, and different ethnic backgrounds that you can learn from. You'll be a better organization as a result of it. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. Another cliche. Um, for me, it was about passion. What do I really want to do? 
Can I work at Kroger? Sure. Can I work at Xerox? Yes. I even had an offer to go work at Wall Street at one point in New York. The money was attractive, but I said, it just wouldn't get me up every day. Go find out what your passion is. Go find out what you love to do. Dig into it. If you love it, you're going to make plenty of money in life. Trust me, that won't be an issue. We've talked about people, the value of that. I mentioned our retention rate. Uh, it, it sounds cliche, but happy, motivated people create happy, motivated customers. And in our business, it all comes down to customer satisfaction. We're, we're small, 300 people or so almost this year. Um, I was employed number 49 four years ago. We've grown. We're going to start with reducing acquisitions and grow even more. But when employees are happy, when they love what they do, they tend to treat customers really well. Happy customers want to send you more work. It's a cycle and it works. All right, let's talk about um, Q&A. Let's talk about you, enough about me. You recognize that language? All right. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna pause there. I was told this would be a talkative group. Questions, extra point for the first one. Yes, sir. What fraternity were you in? Alpha Tau Omega. No way. Yeah. All right. That's what us three right here. Really? All right. You'll have to introduce me to the, you know, the people there. Yes, sir. Um, I, was, I did some research for actually to answer this. Um, your uh, pharmacist, Dr. Burgess, Burgess, I think is her name, uh, project manager, study coordinator. Uh -huh. Is every single one of your study coordinators a uh, physician or RMD or something RMD. Great question. So we have a project with a role called a PI, a project manager or a principal investigator or a biomedical project manager. These are smart people. Uh, about half of our employees have advanced degrees, PhDs, RMDs, masters, etc. Um, I would say about two thirds of our biomedical project managers have those type of degrees, but our two most senior people do not have advanced degrees. They fit the hustle category. They fit the overachievers. They didn't, they, um, their bachelor's degrees, which is very unusual in our business, usually scientific business. You, when you're talking deep science, with chief scientific officers, you've got to know what you're talking about. Those folks uh, were only bachelor's degrees, but they hustled, they worked harder, they overcame, and they now manage um, the majority of our people. Uh, so no, advanced degrees are not required in our business. It helps, but it's not a requirement. Um, twice a year we promote people. It usually happens a uh, July cycle and then a year end. Uh, 20, um, we promoted 23 people this past July in the U.S. and several more in Europe. And if I look back, uh, we have a practice, and I, I hope you'll interpret this the right way, but we force rank all of our employees by segment. So if you're in the science field, and we have 160 of them, we're going to rank you from 1 to 160. We don't share that outside of the executive team. But we, we, those high potential ones, the ones up top, we feed them. We get them whatever they want. We make sure they're happy. They're going to make a lot of money. They're going to move up on a fast track. Those ones in the bottom 10% usually don't last long. We put them on a performance improvement. We tell them where they're cutting, not cutting it. We try to give them feedback. We, we just recently changed from doing semi-annual reviews to reviews every month. Where every month, you're going to get feedback how well you're doing. Real on world feedback. Um, if you're not meeting expectations somewhere. So it's a good question. Other questions? For the individuals that normally do the preclinical or clinical research, uh, I work as a coordinator, but um, I'm trying to do more of a health informatics um, analytics for the actual drugs that you were speaking of. Um, I saw the list of groups that you work with. How many of those monitors or things in that case do you normally hire or have any interest in when it comes to planning your next lab uh, report? Great, great question. So we today work in all different therapeutic classes. So think of a preclinical to phase four when our product's already on the market and it's gone through the FDA process it's been approved. We work in all therapeutic classes, from oncology to cardiovascular to metabolomics, um, all different areas of development, drug development. 
So for us, we're, we've got experts in each one of those areas, but it's, it's more of a broad, um, we call it best of breed. We find deep domain knowledge in those people, and then we find project managers, study coordinators that can organize and be the bridge in between the project manager and sometimes the customer for it to help coordinate that. Sounds like you'd be good at that. Do you have an interest in that? I do. Um, I'm kind of looking most of my uh, secondary masters in research administration as well as um, whether it would be device or medical. There's also a convergence of device and medical that we see a lot of these days, particularly with heart and stents and some of them more where you could have a device and a therapeutic at the same time. And we're, I'm happy to share some examples with you, but it sounds like you'd be good at that. Come on, to my ETO brothers. What's on your mind, guys? How was your experience? It was great. Fantastic. Yeah, a lot of fun. Great memories there. <coughs> um, you have to introduce me. I've been wanting to get back and talk to Pat Brown and the team and say hello to everybody. So, broadly, what, what, give me some ideas. Otherwise, I'm going to call you out. What, what do folks want to do in this room? We've got a lot of juniors and seniors. So, a question. Sure. Um, so, I think the transition between uh, student and business people, I mean business uh, businessman, is one of the toughest uh, transition in life. So, what was the tough and toughest transition between like student and business businessman? So, what was the transition like between student and businessman? Well, I'll tell you, um, when you're a senior in Marshall, you're kind of having fun, especially if you know where you're going to be going. You're on top of the world. You go in the real world and. You're at the bottom of the food chain. So, you know, it's, it's like high school to Marshall and then you graduate, you're back down there. That's the traditional thoughts. I will tell you, um, my advice would be if you're always learning, if you're always networking, it's good. Um, you may, I had to move to a new city, start a new job, learn a lot of new skills, meet new friends. A lot of people have difficulty with that, difficulty with that transition. I think a lot of it's your attitude. If, if you always want to be learning, you want to network, you want to, you, you set goals for yourself, I think it can help. A, a friend once told me it was some good advice to, to write down your goals on a piece of paper uh, once a year. Say it's New Year's Eve, write down your goals. And I'm not talking for next year, write out your goals for 10 to 20 years from now. What do you want to be doing? And then every time that year, go back and revisit that paper. And I, I, I'm a big fan of writing it down, put it somewhere where nobody can see it. You might be embarrassed if they have a chance to see it. And then look at, how have I done? What's changed? You'll, you'll find that as you go through life, you, you, what's important to you at 21, 22 is going to be very different from 30, 40, 50, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, you'll, sometimes you'll have a good laugh and other times you'll reflect and say, hmm, I, I fell short here, but I, I really uh, hit this one. And you'll surprise yourself for what you did. I would encourage you to think big. A lot of people don't think big enough where they're too incremental. Um, so I, I probably didn't really answer your question, but it, it, a lot of it's attitude. I think. All right, I must, what do you want to do? Not sure yet. Not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Business oriented or you don't yeah, know? Business. <laughs> okay. How important is it where you live? Not really. Not really. Good. Then you'll be flexible. We're in Germany. Hamburg. We're hiring a lot of people in Hamburg right now. I'll be there in two weeks, and they're looking to hire another 20 plus people, including business people. And if you can, the official lab language is English, but they're looking for marketing, they're looking for marketing communications, they're looking for research, they're looking for finance. There's a lot of different roles. Yes, sir. Did you uh, do an internship that helped you find that this was your passion, or did you just always know? You know, in between my junior and senior year, I worked on campus here. I was a resident advisor during the year, and then I, I did uh, summer orientation for new students. And so for me, that was good. Uh, looking back, and I tell people in between your junior and senior year, you really should be doing an internship. That, that's what you ought to be focused on, trying to get a job uh, where in a field you'd like to do. If it's a company you'd like to work at, great. A lot of the big consulting companies hire people every year. The, the accounting firms hire interns every year between their junior and senior year. Um, the investment banks hire them every year. Uh, hire people if you want to do mergers and acquisitions. I've done 
kind of 30 plus M&A deals in my career where you're buying and selling companies. JP Morgan, I know the team there, they tend to hire uh, 30 interns every year and they're trying to get diverse, diversity. Diversity in who you are and where you come from in schools. And West Virginia would be a great marketplace to come from because not a lot of people want to, the pool is not as big as New York or California. So if you want to get an M&A, there's a lot of opportunities. <coughs> My son looked into it. He's a sophomore at Northwestern, uh, but there was a lot of M&A shops in Chicago and New York that were hiring. That uh, if you have an interest, I'm happy to put you in touch with some of those people. So, in your industry, looking at like economics and politics, how big is it? Because I know like the FDA, they have a lot of regulations where it takes three to seven years to even get a product to be approved. How does that affect you? That's a great comment. So. Um, to, to bring a new drug to the marketplace for the drugs that we're working on, biologics, large molecule, cost anywhere from a billion to two billion dollars, massive amounts of money. Now these are expensive drugs, they can save your life. The new hepatitis product that came out, $180,000 per treatment, but you're cured, you get rid of it. You can have a normal, functional life at that point. The oncology ones, there's some debate over that. You could be spending 100, 200, 300,000 dollars. It may extend your life two months or it can cure you. Um, and you have to really decide the value that the government right now and insurance companies are hiring a lot of people right now to help them determine economics. What is it worth? How much should I reimburse for these drugs? In uh, what value, what benefit do I get from it? And they're hiring a lot of econ majors, just to let you know. I'm friends with the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they're, they're right now trying to wrestle with what do we, how do we set quality of life and what we're willing to pay for. So there are, there are, particularly if you want to do something like Blue Cross Blue Shield or insurance companies, there's a lot of openings in that field right now. Yes, ma'am. I know you said that um, some of your higher ranking employees and advisors does, um, don't have advanced education. Do you think that, um, speaking like to a lot of seniors, that it's advisable to um, look at your options with just a four year degree and then um, if you find that that's just not something that you can do to go on to college, like a more advanced college, or do you question. think that we should just go ahead and go to grad school and then look at our top opportunities? I think if you want to get an MBA, I would encourage you, and I may get, uh, Avi may slap me on this one, but I would, I would encourage you not to go straight from undergrad to grad school if you want an MBA. I would encourage you, I worked eight years and then went back and got my MBA. I think when you get in, the real world, you have some experience that you can relate to it. And potentially an employer, like in my case, they funded it. They said, hey, you're doing good work for us. If you agree to stay here two more years, we'll pay for your MBA. You'll get a lot more out of it. Than that. I just funded uh, a really up and coming, uh, high potential person in my company. We just paid for his Duke executive MBA. Every other week he went to Duke, every Friday, Saturday, um, $65,000 a year. We just paid for him to get his MBA there because we said, this kid, kids are wrong word, I'm sorry, he's in his 30s. We, we like this person and, and their high potential. So we're going to pay that the cost of that MBA and in return he has to give us two years of working with us afterwards. He's kicking ass. He's he's gonna be he's gonna be just finished his Duke MBA. We just promoted him and he'll probably get promoted again. So if, if you don't have a job, yes, you, you could go back for advanced degrees, but in a perfect world, I would encourage you to try to get a job, get in the field, start deciding what you want to do. And then five, ten years out, seek an MBA. Come on. What do you want to do? Um, not too sure. Not too sure. I'm going to hear it. I just changed my question. All right. Thanks to finance, I'm still looking at A lot of finance roles. If you're open to where you want to live, um, gosh, we, we just hired a finance person. Um, out of school, they, they, they do well, and a year later they got promoted. So, um, smart ones, they work hard. You can wear a lot of different hats. It's a great way to learn a company too. The backbones. What do you want to do? Yeah. An accountant. A lot of demand for accounting right now. You've got a lot of choices, and um, you've got a couple of super regional firms here locally. Um, HPG, Dixon Hughes, a number of them that. Get my contacts afterwards if you want, and I, I know a lot of the senior executives of this firm. If you haven't found something, I'm more than happy to make an introduction. 
West Virginia Mountaineers. You're allowed to wear that shirt here? <laughs> Someone told me, and I, I apologize, I didn't realize that they, my tie was about those colors. I'll have to be more careful. All right. What do you want to do? I want to go to law school. Law school. The world needs more lawyers. <laughs> I, I'm doing a transaction as we speak. I, I hired a, a Boston firm called Show. I was on a conference call with them, and just, I don't mean to literally at two in the morning this morning for about an hour. Just we'll get into it. And when you do MA mergers and acquisitions, you you gotta get things done. It gets tense at the end, etc. But our head lawyer makes a thousand bucks an hour. You do the math, it's a pretty good uh, and they're hiring. So there's opportunities. Um, yes, sir. You said um, about the MBA, like you think um, it would be a good idea to like get in the field and then go back in like five or ten years and get your MBA. Um, what if like you have the option because here at Marshall, uh, you can do the three plus two program. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great like program. Undergrad fees. So what do you think about that? I think it's an amazing program. And Marshall, by the way. <laughs> It's gaining a lot of respect um, as far as the business school. It's, it's becoming ranked. Economics program is, is very well thought of here. Uh, that 3 plus 2 is an amazing program. In that case, if you had an opportunity to do that, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And you'll distinguish yourself when you finish. If you're coming out with an MBA, you're going to be very marketable. I like that. Hokies. Why the Hokies? Uh, I live like an hour from All right. Blacksburg, so. Okay. All right. At least you came to your first choice school, right? <laughs> Cleveland, what do you want to do? I'm not really sure. Finance major. Kind of wait and see where we go. That's what it's like. All right, good. Are you open where you want to live? Yeah. Okay. That's why I'm here, not Cleveland. All right, good. <laughs> good, good answer. All right. Anything else? I'll wrap up unless you've got other topics or questions. Hey. I, I think you're fortunate. You're at a great school. Uh, Marshall's becoming a, uh, having a great reputation. The business school, I mentioned some of the departments here. Uh, you'll stand out. I encourage you to network, hustle a little bit more, distinguish yourself, network. Uh, I'll be out of my contact details. If anybody wants them, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Feel free to call. If you want advice, uh, if I see somebody popping up on LinkedIn, I'm going to accept it. If they're at Marshall, two thirds of you have LinkedIn accounts. I hope the other third of you get it. You need it. If I'm interviewing somebody they don't have a LinkedIn account, well, chances are if I'm interviewing them, they have a LinkedIn account. It'd be highly unusual that they don't. Uh, if they've made it through the screens coming up to me, uh, they better have a LinkedIn account. Something's gone wrong if people below me have screened them and they don't have one because that means they don't have the communication skills with their network. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. Go hurt.
or do like a homecoming tailgate or a couple. Yeah. You know that even yeah. that's ridiculous. No. Happening, I was like, no, I was like, 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 I was